Buongiorno. That's all my Italian. <laughs> Maybe grazie. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, everybody from Skill Lab, the industrial group, Giorgio, and uh, the Posio family for uh, the warm welcome that you've all given me to your country. This is my first visit to Italy. I've been in other parts of Europe before, but uh, never in Italy. And uh, I have to say, uh, your uh, area is very, very beautiful, and the people uh, could not have been nicer to me. So thank you for that. Uh, today, uh, for some of you, I think uh, there won't be any new lessons in what I say, uh, but I hope that maybe you'll stop and reflect on uh, some of the words and think a little deeper about them. For the rest of you, maybe some of these things are new, and I'm going to ask you to keep a very open mind about what I have to say. Uh, I have been working at Lean for since the late 80s in some way or another. I came out of private industry. Uh, and then went into training and consulting. Um, but what I can tell you is, as a, an eternal student of Lean, there's always more to learn. And many of the words that are on my slides, I continue to reach new depths at what they really mean when it comes to the people part of applying this in our businesses. So um, this picture is kind of my backyard uh, back in Massachusetts. I live about 15 miles from where this is. And my small organization is based in Boston at the University of Massachusetts Boston campus. So we're about three miles to the left of that end of the picture, but we're also right on the water. So we have an, a, a, a rather nice uh, view for a university. Um, as, a, as an organization, as Giorgio said, it's very easy for us to do what we do because every person who works in our organization who goes out and trains and consults is a practitioner of lean who came out of private industry. So we are people who have done this on the shop floor with people. So it's with great passion that we come to uh, our client base. So our biggest frustrations are that more organizations don't understand the benefits to be gained from applying this kind of thinking. They maybe start and then they stop and they don't get as far as they can or they say, oh, no, no, we're, that's, we tried that last year. Well, I, I hope one of the things that you take away from me today is that this is a business strategy that never ends. So with that, let's uh, move forward. Uh, as Giorgio said, we have a very simple mission in our organization, and that is that we would like to help organizations improve their productivity through people so that they can be more competitive. Um, at GBMP, uh, a good deal of our revenue comes from training consulting. We are a private not-for-profit, which means that we, have to, we don't get any funding from anyone, so we have to go out and, and provide services or products to uh, uh, sustain our livelihood. So in addition, we offer some videos and training products, and um, we've been very fortunate that uh, the folks from Leanovator here in Italy have uh, found interest in our products and have translated many of them into Italian and more to come. So uh, you don't have to listen to them all in English anymore if you'd like to watch them. You'll be seeing a little bit of the couple of clips from a couple of our videos today to help reinforce some of the points that I want to make. So that's who we are, um, very small, only about 13 people in my organization. So I want to start by talking about giving you the foundation that I come from in terms of lean. Where, what is it, what's it all about, and why is it so important that people uh, be viewed as the central asset of the system? So if we look at this drawing, what I want you to take from this, if you can remember nothing else about lean and what it is, uh, it's about reducing the timeline, the time between paying and getting paid, from the time your organization is investing in raw materials and people skills until such time as you can produce and deliver a product or service and get paid back for your investment, receive cash on the other end. Right, so in a nutshell, Lean is about trying to reduce that time. But it's how we do it and what we look for that makes a Lean different, I think. What we're really looking for is to explore every activity that occurs on this white line down the middle. And we refer to that line as the value stream. And if you think about that, it's like the stream of activities necessary to deliver that product or service. What we know is that the total time that an order 
from your customer uh, stays in that value stream, that a great deal of that time is not spent on things the customer is willing to pay for. Okay, so for example, do uh, I would like you to raise your hand if anybody in your organization spends time during the work week walking around, looking for something, uh, trying to get an answer, searching for a tool. Do I have anybody who needs any of those things? All right, the rest of you are lying. Um, okay, so, and the way to think about this is if the customer was standing beside your employees while they're doing those things, the customer would say, I don't want to pay for that. So the central focus of Lean is to have every eye in the business looking for these things that don't add value. So in this equation, we say time is equal to value-added and non-value-added activities. So what we're focused on is we would like to maximize the value-added, the things the customer wants to pay for, like producing the product, uh, developing a report if you're generating reports, uh, going to the conference if you're forming the conference, all right? but not all these other things. And our premise is that the people in the organization come to work to do a good job. But oftentimes the systems we provide them to do their work are not so good. So my other equation on this page is good people and good process equals outstanding results. And the lean premise is that you have very good people they want to do a good job. No one comes to work and says, well, let me just go over there and make trouble today. That's not usually what they want to do. So the job is to create the system so that the people can be 100% effective every day. So our job as leaders is to help expose the things that create non-value added for our people and that if we reduce or eliminate them, we have more time, more capacity, more floor space, more cash, and those are, those are the outcomes that we can use to create a competitive advantage in our business. All right, now, the truth of the matter is, if, if you look at this as the series of activities that have to go on to fulfill an order in an organization, uh, a great deal of that time is not value added, as I said. But unfortunately, the traditional approach to business uh, from the time when I entered business and was coming through the ranks, very often was focusing on uh, let's make that person work faster. Gee, if we could only get the assembly of those two parts to be instead of 40 seconds, 35 seconds, we would be a heroes. Okay, but wait a minute. What if I cut that time down 10 seconds, but that part still sits for three days before it goes to the next department? That's the problem. So this visual, what we want to uh, focus on is not the white aspects, the aspects that the customer is going to pay for, but all the things that are between that. And that's what we're training eyes to see is what is that time and what causes it. And that's when we can start to make big, big gains. Ten seconds out of ten weeks is nothing, is it? If we've got a lead time of 10 weeks to our customer, gaining 10 seconds isn't much. But if I can pull three days out of uh, waiting in that process, then I'm starting to have some impact on that. All right, so we're looking for where are the things that slow or stall the flow of the value. And then the question becomes, who is in the best position to point them out? And you know what I'm going to say, right? It's the people. It's the people that do the work. All right, so uh, unfortunately... Uh, historically, many of us uh, have thought that as leaders and managers, we have to have all the answers. But you know what? We can't be everywhere all the time. And all the organizations I visit, and most of our clients are small to medium-sized organizations, much like yours. Uh, even in small organizations, the leaders can't be everywhere. So what you need is you need every eye looking for them. And you have to respect that they have the knowledge and the creativity to help you solve those problems. So if you look at some of the uh, thought leaders in Lean and what they say this really is. So John Shook, who I know pretty well and who wrote a book on value stream mapping, he also has one on uh, um, managing and A3s and a number of tools related to Lean. But really he talks about the fact that this is a philosophy that's shortening the lead time between customer order and shipment by eliminating waste. And the very simple explanation of waste things the customer doesn't want to pay for. 
And then another uh, early thought leader, James Womack, who will be uh, keynoting at our conference this year. We know him pretty well, and I've known him since the 80s, um, who wrote The Machine That Changed the World and Lean Thinking, uh, and actually, I guess, sort of coined the term lean. He says we can reduce this to three basic principles, flow and pull and perfection or striving for excellence. Another word for perfection or ideal is true north. All right, so we want to flow value as, qu as quickly as we can to the customer, but we want that value to be pulled through the organization based on the customer's real requirements so that we're not producing too fast or too slow. But probably most important is this concept of striving for excellence. All right, so this is what allows us to understand that until we're perfect, we should not stop improving. All right. So what do they mean by perfect? Well, in Lean, we're always measuring things in terms of quality, cost, delivery, and our ability to satisfy customers. So if we're perfect, that means we can have zero defects. Uh, if we have perfect lead time, it means the customer can have it like that. If we have perfect cost, it means we have the lowest cost to produce of anyone, anywhere. And if we have 100% customer satisfaction, it means they can have anything they want, anytime they want. Now, please uh, call me if you get there, because I would like to come and visit your Too plan. Too people call me. But the point is not finishing the journey. The point is the journey. And so we're always looking for that gap between where we are and trying to close that gap uh, through the knowledge and the creativity of our people. So in this regard, when we're trying to climb towards that ideal place, uh, Lee looks at this as a very scientific approach to work. All right, so what does that mean? If we go back to our science classes, we understand that that starts with understanding how, where we are today, our current condition. And then having an idea for how we can change that current condition, the hypothesis, if you will. And then we've got to go ahead and we've got to test that hypothesis, an experiment. And then we check the results and we say, did, did the outcome occur the way we expected? If it did, then we want to standardize and capture that gain so that we don't lose it again. If not, then we may have to experiment more. But that's what we mean by these cycles of PDCA, which means plan, do, check, act. All right? But always heading us in the direction of that ideal state. So for leaders, you need to have a vision for what that state is so that you can share that with your people. <laughs> All right. Um, they are the engine in your organization. They are the horsepower. I don't care how much automation uh, you have in your company and how uh, great your computer systems are. The bottom line is that how well they work, how well the machines or the uh, computers are programmed, or whether or not we know if they're actually providing the output in terms of service or product that the customer desires, really comes from the people, doesn't it? So it's the engagement of the hearts and minds of those people. And in Lean, the way that we get that is through practice. Like most things in life, the way we learn is by doing. And in Lean, it's the same way. We can read many books, but when it really becomes real is when we apply it in our world to our processes. Okay? So the concept like uh, just in time or what is a pull system, uh, we can read about it. But until a person starts trying to figure out how many bins do I need to have or how much inventory between these two processes, that's when it really starts to have meaning for them. So as leaders, we would like to remind you that you always have to be teaching and sharing and growing people. That's really the secret here. Toyota, uh, who's really the, uh, were the creators of what is today known as Lean, they will tell you that the secret to their success has nothing to do with all the tools and techniques. It has everything to do with their ability to develop people, to grow knowledge in their organizations and share that knowledge. One thing that often people have a misconception, um, you know, because it started in manufacturing, and often in many companies that's where it starts, there's a, a feeling sometimes that this is a manufacturing thing. Oh, that's for those operations people, you know. It wouldn't work in my place. This is a bank or this is a, uh, an architectural firm or something else. But what I'd like you to understand that the principles of Lean are universal. They apply in any business or any service organization, uh, government. Uh, we actually have a, a video that we created with a Lean dentist, uh, and it's quite compelling. 
He's looked at uh, his patients and he's decided that he has to treat one mouth at a time and his job is to get mouths healthy. So when he thinks about that, when you go to his office as a patient, everybody comes to the patient and they can get um, a uh, checkup, they can get a filling, they can get a crown, all in the same visit, all in the same chair. And what, why is that important to the patient? Because uh, what Dr. Bari has proven that he can heal, he can make a healthy mouth about 50% faster than other dentists by treating the patient that way. Now think about what that means to you. Not three visits, one visit. So I'd like to share with you now uh, a couple of video clips uh, just from different companies in different areas of the company and how they've applied this. And there will be, uh, guess what, we have a pull system for our water bottles now. As we use one, we introduce a new one to it on a signal system. So, All right, so what I'd like to do now is put a little bit of a framework on this for you. Um, we use this triangle very often to describe the lean process, and oftentimes we're focused on some techniques that we talk about inside it. But what I want to talk about today is what's outside it. And the first thing I'd like to say is I'd like you to think of this triangle like a three-legged three -legged stool. All right, so you see the words philosophy, management, and techniques around it. All right, so what happens with a three-legged stool when you don't have all three legs? It doesn't hold up. So what's important is to understand that we need to understand the basic philosophies which govern all of our activities, the lean philosophies, and I'll be sharing those with you in a minute. But then it has to be supported by the correct management structure to create the environment where it can flourish and grow. And then the third leg, which is the techniques, the technical aspects of lean, these are the tools of lean, all right? Many of which you have heard about 5S, uh, Kanban, uh, pull systems, uh, Pokeyogi, which is mistake proofing. But what we often see in the States is that people have come to think of lean as being just the tools, all right? And they say, if I just uh, get another tool, I must be doing lean. But that's incorrect. Because like most things in life, we need to bring the right tool to the right problem to be successful with it. So ultimately, it's about the engine, which is your people. But we have to give them the right philosophies, a supportive management system, and then prepare them with the right tools so that when they occur, a problem occurs in their workplace, that they in fact know how to solve it and have the support they need. So let's talk about what we mean by these basic philosophies. All right, this is one of those slides that uh, when I first saw these words, I said, oh, I get that. I know what this means. But two, after many, many years, I still think I don't know exactly what these words mean when it comes to applying them. So let's share. The first philosophy of Lean says that we want every person in our organization to have a customer's first, customers first philosophy of at their job. What we mean by that is every day when everybody comes to work, we want their first question to be, what does the customer need from me today and what improvements can I make so that I can do a better job of serving that customer? And by customer, we don't just mean the one that ultimately pays the bill. We have internal customers as well because truly the value stream that we saw on the screen is made up of a chain of customers and suppliers and all those relationships have to be linked appropriately so that we ultimately deliver the best product to the customer at the right time. So everybody every day thinking about what does the customer want from me as well as what do they value and then that becomes a very high standard. So when you walk to uh, say the trash can at the end of the room and back as part of your job then you begin to say, what would the customer think about that? And then you have to really start to say, uh, am I at a standard that the customer would find acceptable? And if we're not, then we can talk about what we do about it. The second philosophy says that we have to really treat employees as our most valuable asset. Right? It is through the people that we provide all the value that we deliver. So this is really about creating conditions where people can be successful every day. So from Toyota, one of the things that I learned is the, they, the way they look at people's work and how we are to improve the work that people do, they term it easier, better, faster, cheaper, and in that order, all right? And that's quite different than traditional. Most of the time when we start, we're talking about how do we make that cheaper? 
But Toyota's view is if I make it easier for that person to do that job, then it's going to be easier then to make it a better process, a better product, and then it will move faster and ultimately we will deliver greater value for less cost. The third philosophy is about where do we look for improvement. It's called a workplace focus, and what it says is that you really have to be in the workplace communicating and working closely with the people that do the work if you really want to understand where the problems are. All right, so especially as leaders, we have to be more present in the workspace so that we have more opportunities to communicate why we need to change, because this is about changing, as well as to really understand what's impacting the people um, and what's getting in the way of their work. And then the final philosophy of continuous improvement is this word Kaizen, which actually means continuous improvement. And this is the concept of everybody every day, that we don't want this to be a special activity that occurs once in a while. Oh, once a year we bring the A team in and we turn the floor upside down and we make some great improvement. That's not what continuous improvement philosophically is all about. All right, you may get some gains, but you really haven't changed your culture. And that's really what you're trying to do, is to get people engaged on a regular basis. So you have to develop that spirit, that passion in your people. And this is a leadership effort, because it's very hard sometimes to change uh, people who have maybe for many years not trusted you, or um, we've had policies and practices that have discouraged their involvement. So it's hard work, and it takes a, a long time but the benefits are great. So now we've talked about the four philosophies. That was only one leg of the triangle, correct? So now let's shift over to the management side of that triangle. So from the point of view of management, their responsibility is to create what we call the favorable environment for improvement. And this has, uh, takes many forms. You know, First of all, it may be providing some training and education on what lean is, uh, time to actually practice, um, the new methods, uh, being prepared for people to maybe make a mistake the first time through. Um, because we're adults, we, ha are, we are human, so we have to learn things through experience, through actions, through trying, etc. And this is what we mean uh, in terms of the know why as well as the know how. What we're saying is Leaders have a responsibility to explain to people what is it about our organization that is requiring us to change. Um, the, the president of the SME, he was talking a great deal about some um, economic issues that have uh, you faced in your country, in your region. And so this is important information to share with your employees so they understand that this is about saving jobs and making sure that there are jobs for our children and our children's children uh, in this area. So people want to be able to connect to, what is the reason you want me to change? Because we're very comfortable, aren't we, in our own little routines. For example, if you go into your bathroom in the morning and you know where that toothbrush is and that toothpaste, and if you go in there and someone's moved it, you get kind of uncomfortable. But the same thing with our employees. If I can if I can accept that my toothbrush has been moved, perhaps if I understand the greater reason for that. So you need to provide that know why. The know how becomes easy then because these are tools. Tools are not hard to learn to use, but if they don't understand why you're giving them tools and why it's important to change, why would they take the risk to do that? You're also responsible for setting a strategy. Because I don't know about you, but most of the businesses I visit, they have way more problems uh, to work on than time or people. So in the organization, it becomes important to pick the few problems that are most important to solve. And that may change year to year, but essentially you've got to create a direction and then provide resources and time to work on those problems and then check back frequently with those employees to make sure that you're giving them feedback and they can see uh, that there's a cause and effect relationship between what they're working on and how it's impacting the business. And finally, we come to the third leg of the stool, which is simply the techniques. Um, you know, there's a whole list of them there, and there's many more than those uh, that many of you may already know about. But um, there's a reason that these are not referred to as solutions. They're called countermeasures. 
And the thought of this, the, the rationale for this is that we apply the tool to help us to close the gap that we have today to get to a better place. But until we're perfect, we haven't got the final solution, have we? What we've got is something a little bit better. We've countered a problem that we had. So we want to use those tools to help get us to that next point, but remembering that this is cycles of improvement. They're a means to an end, not an end in themselves. Okay? So, and this is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the key problems is a lot of people have failed because they fail to understand that lean is much more than the tools. It's a business strategy. It's a growth strategy. It's not just get out your toolbox and figure out what to do with the tools. So many companies, though, fail to see that they have organizational structures, perhaps policies, perhaps uh, historic behaviors that are, make it hard to implement lean. Um, and, uh, you're going to see an example of one. I'm, I think I'm going to ask, well, I'll read, this, I'll read the cartoon and then uh, it'll get translated for you. An example of how sometimes your measures can go against you or, or drive the wrong behaviors in organization. In many companies for many years, uh, our levels of inventory have hid problems. For example, I've worked in businesses where uh, if somebody found a bad part, they just threw it to the side because they had so many more that they could continue to work on that nobody ever saw it as a problem that they had a bad part. But from the point of view of the customer and the business, that's a big problem because we are wasting our time and our resources on those bad parts. So Lean would say we need to drive down that inventory and solve those problems, not accept those issues. In many organizations, uh, the administrative aspects of the work are seen as secondary to the process. But remember what I said, this applies in every area of the business, whether it's the sales quoting process, the negotiation process, the design of the new product, the logistics aspect of the business. Um, they can be as critical to satisfying your customer as producing the part itself. So we need to look everywhere. And a lot of the companies, uh, I will give you one tip today. If, if you can do this one thing for all your employees, you probably will be taking a step in the right direction. And that's very simply creating a condition where every employee knows every day how they're doing in relation to the customer's expectations. You know, I go to many plants and I will say to somebody, how do I tell if you're ahead or behind? And they'll say things like, well, I'll find out at the end of the month. They'll send me a report and they'll say how I did. Well, that's a problem because it's too late. What we want is to create a condition where if there's any abnormalities, if we're falling behind, that it stands out immediately so we can begin to do something. So if you leave here today and you take this one thing away is thinking about how can I get more and more of my employees to know every hour how are we doing based on the customer's expectation, then you will be moving in the right direction. Well, um, I want to share with you a little cartoon. Dilbert is a uh, fairly famous in the United States, so this is a little cartoon, and I'd like to read through, um, hopefully the uh, translators can hear what I say. So the first one says, hello, this is technical support. May I close your ticket now? And the second one, this is Dilbert. Um, no, you haven't helped me yet. I just called you. And the tech support says, well, I'm not evaluated on how helpful I am. I'm evaluating, evaluated on how many trouble tickets I close. So Dilbert says, your stubbornness is becoming an obstacle to my financial success. Oh, no, that's what he says to Dilbert. Your stubbornness is becoming an obstacle to my financial success. And by the way, if our call gets disconnected, I count that as a closed ticket. Dilbert says, I'll make it quick. And the guy says, what, what? I can't hear you. And he hangs up. And Dale Dilbert says, son of a beach ball. And he says, on the plus side, my goal of hating one new stranger every day is right on track. So I hope that that humor comes through somewhat. But the point of this is, what's driving this technical support person's behavior? It's what he's being measured on. Okay, believe it or not, I can tell you a very similar story. We were teaching in a hospital organization. We were talking about the importance of measuring the right thing. And one of the uh, vice presidents of the hospital spoke up and she said, I went to the grocery store the other day, and the clerk was lining all the grocery products up on the belt before she scanned them across the, bar, the barcode. And I couldn't, the woman says, I couldn't understand what she was doing. She said, I asked her about it. And the, the clerk said, 
oh, well, we're getting measured on how quickly we get from the beginning of the order to the end of the order. So from when I scan the first barcode on your order until the last. Okay, so what that really translated to is the customer is going to stand there and wait while she organizes the products very nicely, and then she's going to scan them really quick. But the customer, who is they thinking about? The customer or the measurement? This is a problem. And here's another one. Remember, this is 90% about people. And so these guys have uh, decided they finally have a problem when they only have one person left who has an idea and he's left the company. So folks, what we're saying is we want to turn that upside down. We want everybody to have ideas and we want everybody to have many skills so that the organization is not dependent on one person. And I'll also say that in your lean journey, this is an important aspect because many organizations will start to go backwards if they only have one leader who's really driving this and that leader leaves. So we're trying to spread the wealth. So in your organization, we say that there's two key skills that you need every employee to gain to be successful with lean. And they come in this order. One is problem identification and one is problem, and the second is problem solving. Because first and foremost, our goal is to illuminate or light up problems. Um, the Toyota people would say, make problems ugly. So that's why we want to use our tools to help them stand out. Because if we can't see them, and this is what Dr. Shingo was saying, one of the early implementers of Toyota Production System together with Teichi Ono, if we can't see them, we can't do anything about them. And his, his, his premise was also that people want to do the right thing, so first and foremost we must teach them to identify waste. Once we can see it, then we can use our problem solving, we can learn our formal problem solving methods to solve it. But I have a question today. What is the problem? This is a big debate in many organizations. So I'm going to give you a very simple answer to this question. A problem is when the current condition is not equal to the standard. All right, now that sounds straightforward, right? But here's the problem in many organizations. The standard may not exist or may be very unclear or may be different for different people. So what I will share with you is that a premise of lean is that you must have a foundation of stability and standardization before you really have a baseline for improvement. Because if everybody's doing it every which way and you try to make an improvement, how do you really know whether you've improved or whether that's a sustainable improvement? Okay, So current condition not equal to standard. So what we're really seeking here is everyone in your organization to become a thinker and a doer. My boss used to draw this pyramid, which was the traditional hierarchy, which would have a couple of bosses up here and all the rest of the people at the bottom of the pyramid. And we would talk about the fact that in, as when we were first coming into business, the thought was all the thinkers were only up in that top bit of the pyramid. And that was kind of what was expected. We're supposed to have all the answers. Well, in Lean, we'd like to turn that totally upside down and say everybody is a thinker and everybody's a doer. Now, to, to encourage that, what we require is leaders who see their job as working for the employees. Huh, that's a different way of looking at things, isn't it? Most of us think we work for our shareholders or for our customers. But in Lean, we want people to believe that they work for their employees to help those employees do a better job at satisfying customers. So that's what we mean by servant leaders. And in that role, they have to become coaches, mentors, and teachers. And this is often a, an uncomfortable shift for many people, especially in the middle of the organization. So as leaders, we have to practice. We have to change, too. We have to create alignment because there's too many things to work on. So as leaders, we have to pick those things that are most critical for the business. What do we need to do? Is lead time our biggest issue or is uh, quality our biggest issue? What is most important and how are we going to direct the resources appropriately? Because people need your help in figuring out what's most important to work on. We need to provide free freedom to experiment. All right, This is about experimentation. And people will make some mistakes. But here's my uh, philosophy on this. 
if you put the right people on the problem, and by that I mean generally the people who do the work, supported by the people who are their customers and suppliers and their engineers, etc. If you put them all together, they won't make big mistakes. They'll make small mistakes. Okay? So, but what you do if they make a mistake is going to be critical to whether they continue to improve. If you say, that was a crazy thing you did, Anna, don't do that again, how many more ideas are they going to come up with? Or how many more improvements are they going to try? So we have to remember that that condition, they have to create what we term mental safety for people. And finally, you have to expect that as they get experience, they can solve bigger problems. They will become more confident and they can take on more. So remember, this is about people development. Right. We use a very simple model to describe this whole process. One is to understand that there is a set of tools out there, those reliable methods. All right. And the second is creating the right environment for to nurture and grow this lean effort. And the third is to make sure that everybody remains practiced. So the problem, though, is, is that the 90% of this is really has nothing to do with technology or tools. It's more about people skills as people. All right, so let's apply this to something that you might relate to. I bet there's no one in this room that can't ride a bicycle. Okay? But let's think about what are the reliable methods for learning to ride the bike. You know, we have to learn balance. We have to learn how to steer it, how you pedal, and how you put the brakes on, right? Oh, so let me guess. When you guys all first got on the bike the first time, you just went out and rode 10 miles. That was it, right away. I don't think so. Oh, but here's what happened then. You fell off, but here's what you did. You went in the house and you said, Mom and Dad, would you please take me to the library so I can get a book to learn how to ride this bike? I don't think so. But what did it really come down to? Well, my guess is it came down to a favorable environment and some practice. Maybe you had a mom or a dad who ran behind you, held the bike. Maybe they got you some training wheels. Maybe you had some encouragement from your brothers and sisters. Uh, but most likely you had somebody that said, I know you can do this. You know, look, your brother learned. I know you're as smart as your brother or sister. You can do this, okay? And in the end, how did you learn to ride the bike? You practiced. And you got better. And you did get so you could ride 10 miles and not fall off and take bigger trips and, uh, you know, do all kinds of exciting things with that bike. So it's the same way with lean. And ladies and gentlemen, what I'll tell you is that we really get this when it comes to our kids and, and nurturing them and realizing they will make mistakes. If you could bring that same thought process to your workplace, then you'll be miles ahead of many people. Now, so I've been talking a lot about this idea of the favorable environment. What I'd like to show you now is some clips from this video, Moments of Truth, where we talk about the importance of, of, of how you interact with people um, to either inhibit or accelerate, accelerate the lean journey. So uh, let's take a look. I think uh, what I hope you heard, my favorite in there is the young, two young men uh, from the stair company. Um, and how their thinking changed, and I actually got to watch that. At the beginning, they would be like, oh, I can't believe I have to go learn about this. But they became so excited about what they could accomplish now that people listen to them. Okay? So I'm almost done. I just want to leave you with a, a few thoughts uh, about why I'm so passionate about everybody every day. Because, you know, you have so much knowledge and creativity sitting in your company that you're not taking advantage of right now. Right? It's there. I'm always amazed at what the people that do the work come up with uh, when you just ask them to provide some help and you start to uh, respond. You fix a couple of things that bug them and you'll have a friend for life, I'm, I guarantee it. This is about sharing the leadership, not consolidating the leadership, okay? so that we can do a better job in the long run for everybody in the organization. It's about respecting people in all work. Every job is necessary and important to your organization, whether it's the person who opens the gate in the morning or the person who uh, is filing the financial statement. Everybody has their role and they all have to work right. 
So we want to divide and conquer. We want many people to share in this journey. But it doesn't happen by chance. It's a different way of thinking about work. So I want to leave you with a few examples and then uh, your, uh, my esteemed uh, colleagues up here uh, are going to share with you some of their personal experiences, I think, with this. But this is just a couple from my group. Uh, this is, we provide, uh, in the state of Massachusetts, people can get grants for training and they have to demonstrate at the end of the grant what they got as a result of that training. This organization, which is, makes uh, gears and machine parts, uh, for every dollar they invested in training, they were able to demonstrate they got $133 in return. And this lists some of the ways that they uh, uh, improved to do that. But I'm more interested often in uh, some of the, the words. So this is one of the people that works for us. I'm just read this. The opportunities to make these types of gains exist in most ma machining businesses if only you're willing to learn to see them and commit to acting on them. For example, one of our first videos of a bend and changeover on a lathe showed the employee walked a half a mile in the course of a two and a half hour changeover. A setup improvement team made up, made up of operators and support personnel created a setup cart and rethought the entire changeover process, among other things. The result was a 150 minute changeover drop to 60 minutes, 2,600 feet of walking was reduced to 495 feet, and the activities that had to be done while the machine was stopped went from 27 to 13. Together, these changes mean more capacity, greater flexibility to meet customer needs, and a lot less stress and strain on the workers. One example. Okay, this is a uh, marketing department of a medical device company. This young lady had the responsibility of making up the sales binders when they had to go to a trade show when they signed on new uh, sales force. Okay, and it was a real pain in the butt for her to do this. Um, all the papers were all over the place, and it was. And she said, her, one of her statements was, I can't train anybody else to help me because it's so hard, there's so much to it. And we actually made her lay out all the parts she had to put in the binder, and here they are. All right, so the team, with her help and her input, changed the system so all of this is in one drawer, color-coded, so it became very easy for her to create these binders. And this looks like a stage picture, but she actually did this. She did this and said this um, at the end of this couple of days of Kaizen about her new system and said, I can get somebody to help me now. We can hire a temp, and in 10 minutes I can teach them the system. And these are some of the results that she got um, on her process as a result of this small improvement effort in the marketing department. This is a team-based Kaizen that occurred in a single day with one of our consultants in an organization that uh, makes all the uh, display power and protection products for retail organizations. I mean, I'm not going to go through all this, but you, there was some activity in the cutting department, the punching department, the assembly department, test pack. But this is one day, one day for these people working together to get these kind of results. And so the comment here is the management team at Boston Retail Products is committed to the application of continuous improvement to improve processes and compete internationally. Boston Retail Products has made the transition from a training-focused organization to a learning-focused organization. The results shown here demonstrate the power of team-based process Kaizen. They were eye-opening to all. Since the single-day event, Boston Retail has worked to sustain and to further improve the process. And one last one, Ophir Optics. This is a, uh, a company that makes precision infrared optics and photonics. Um, there's a number of improvements that they cite here, but I think it's uh, more interesting to hear what the director of operations had to say about this. The payback for giving people time to learn and practice lean and Six Sigma concepts has been well worth the effort. We have experienced a 70% reduction in lens manufacturing lead time and a total inventory reduction of 20%. And most of our results and improvements have come about through employee project work and suggestions. So, from the people. So, I would like, I hope that the message is loud and clear that my passion is the employees in your organization and that that's the real secret to this. So I thank you for your time, and I wish you well on your lean journeys. But please, if those of you haven't, get started. Those of you who are on the journey, keep going.
Quite thank you. Uh, Bob, you have nothing to add. And um, I just have to thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your experience with us. Uh, forse abbiamo una domanda eh, e poi comunque se vogliamo fare domande eh, siccome la, la sala poi è, che viene utilizzata è solo questa possiamo farla anche col microfono quindi chi volesse no no it's in English even okay well, I, I can read it in English if you want when we start implementing this approach, we have a lot of problems everywhere. How do we know where to start and where to expand? Does it make a difference? Um, in the beginning, we encourage you to um, pick a small area to start with to prove to people that this will work. And in fact, we suggest that you stack the decks. And what I mean by that is you pick an area where you know there's a strong likelihood that there'll be a success and that your people in that area maybe are some of you more willing to change. Don't pick your toughest people in the beginning. But what you look for is a small victory in that first area to demonstrate to people that this really is about helping them and things can get done. Once you've done that, then you can step back and you can start to think about where do we really need to apply the benefits in order for the rest of the organization to um, get the full benefit of this. And the other thing you can do early on is 5S. In almost any area, that's a good starting tool because um, it's about creating stability and standardization. Almost every area can benefit from that, office or plant. Altra domande? La speranza è sempre di avere degli eventi interattivi, quindi ci, ci fate un favore se fate domande. Lopa, hello again. Nice to see you. I, I have a question. How do you deal with the push managers? Uh, push managers, okay. So what I, uh, one of the best ways to deal with them is to get them out to see other organizations and let them talk to their direct peer at another company. So if I get an operations manager talking to another operations manager and that, that other operations manager says, oh, I used to be just like you. I thought the only way to run this plant was push, push, push. And they talk about what they've learned. That's a big help. You might also give them some things to read as well. But in the long run, if you've got a manager that just can't change, they may have to leave. Okay? Most times they can come around, but once in a while you get one that just can't change, and you better to remove them. Just one comment. I don't have my own business, of course, but I think this is a question a lot of people in here maybe want to ask. Um, we are in Italy. We are not in the United States. It's not easy to make somebody go away if he doesn't appreciate what we're doing. So, um, if you could maybe focus a bit more on um, uh, what your advice would be to get that person to um, play in your team rather than playing yeah. against you, since we can't really kick them out. Okay, um, a few things you can do when you. Uh, some of the most eye-opening things that I've done with managers often have to do with having them do a value stream map together with the team where you go through the different parts of the process together and they hear from the people that do the work. Their eyes become wide open. They think they know what's really happening. They may be thinking they're managing this, but when they really see what people have to go through, sometimes it's extremely eye-opening. Um, also, if they visit, uh, let's say it's an internal manager who's supplying another department, if they go down and visit that other department and understand how they, what they do impacts that department, Sometimes that will open their eyes. Um, the mapping process is really often very eye-opening for managers because we can, we can quantify how much waste is in the process. So when we map, one of the things, one of the outcomes is, is what is your lead time based on the amount of actual work versus how much time is represented by inventory <coughs> sitting at rest. And very often we'll come away with uh, 10 minutes spent on adding value in, 22 days where it sits around. And sometimes that's enough to get them going, you know, compelling reason. Uh, the last thing, if you're a manager who has someone who works for you that is like that, 
one of the things that you can do is you can change how you reward them. You can change the measures that you um, appraise them by. For example, if you said next year your key goal is to um, get more people involved in improvement and I'm looking for you to um, get more ideas from your people, then you have a kind of a concrete expectation that you're setting for that person. And lastly, what I'd say is model the behavior that you want to see in that manager yourself. If they work for me, I need to develop them. I need to take them out and show them what it means to be uh, a pull manager, not a push manager. Okay?